The following program has been pre recorded, so please don't call in at this time. If you wish to participate in the program, tune in at 5 p.m. every Wednesday for A Pause for Thought on Baton Rouge Community Radio. <laughs> Good evening, fellow humans. This is Wayne Parker with a pause for thought here on Baton Rouge Community Radio, 96.9 FM here in Baton Rouge. Well, here we are again, everybody, boys and girls, ladies and germs, all that stuff. I, mean, I don't know if I forget who that was, but I just came, I just flew in from Chicago, and boy, are my arms tired. But um, anyway, we, uh, we have an interesting topic tonight, at least for Lang and me. We hope you enjoy it, too. And this is also a live call-in show, 343-9927, 343-9927. If you'd like to call in and share your thoughts, questions, and ideas or objections on the topic of the evening. And before I get any further, let me welcome my faithful co-host, Lang Baker. Lang, good evening. Yeah, howdy, Wayne. Good to have you here. Glad to be here. And I'm just curious, you know, referring to that... Um, public service announcement just prior to coming on the air here what's what's pure mutt like a pure bread and pure mutt um anyway just just curious take that up on a future program yeah right sure um okay we're going to talk tonight about the apparent or supposed overdiagnosis or the high rate of diagnosis of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder in um, poor people in, in, in really in the entire Western world. Uh, that's, that's actually what, what got me thinking about this. And um, it was an article in um, the, um, the Economist called Too Often Poverty is Treated with Pills. And it states here that according to a study conducted by the Milken Institute School of Public Health at George Washington University, in 2011, 12% of American children and teenagers had a diagnosis of ADHD, an increase of 43% from 2003. And um, they also point out here that sales of prescription stimulants, stimulants, stimulants like those used to treat ADHD quintupled between 2002 and 2012. So... The diagnosis of ADHD has jumped tremendously, and the prescription of the stimulants to to treat it have also jumped tremendously. And they also point out that uh, there are abnormally high rates of psychiatric diagnosis and medication use among poor and very young Americans. Um, That was confirmed by another study or report published by the Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry. Uh, and allied disciplines. They also they, they cited studies from the United States, United Kingdom, Scandinavian countries, Australia, and Germany that ADHD is apparently more prevalent by a large margin among um, people from a, so, a low social economic status. And um, of course, there's two different I, arguments here that we were talking about earlier. One is the uh, supposed overdiagnosis and the apparent fact that it does exist, or the overprescription, I guess. Um, anyway, before we get too far into the meat of the topic, Lang, I, I did want to talk about just exactly what attention deficit hyperactive disorder is. And I went online and found a few places, one of which was the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, which calls ADHD a neurobehavioral disorder, de- behavioral disorder. Well, I'm having a problem tonight. And the National Institute of Mental Health calls it a brain disorder, and other people say that it's a genetic uh, disorder. But there was a guy that you listened to in a TED Talk recently, I believe. Yep who was diagnosed with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, who says it ought to be attention difference disorder, right? Right, right. That was his, his contention. He, he was a college student, and he was giving this TED Talk at, at this, or TEDx at this college. 
And uh, his contention was that actually he just his brain processes differently and perceives differently, and he sees it as an advantage. Uh, and he he attributes the, his ability to to uh, manifest it this way through the kind of schooling he had, which recognized that he processed differently and didn't see it as something to to. Uh, criticize him for but in, or punish him for or hold him back for but actually use the advantages of that different way of perceiving the world and processing to uh, to enhance his education and his uh, advancement in his studies. Didn't you say he mentioned that um, he could really really focus well on something that interested him. Well, yeah, and this has been this is reported in other literature about ADHD that people diagnosed with that have much greater focus on something that they are really interested in. Yeah. And so I'm wondering if maybe they're super developed in some ways in their brain and so they get bored or they get they get just get bored and um, drift off or whatever when the topic is not moving fast enough or the, you know, the teacher's not moving along fast enough with the subject or uh, it just doesn't interest them as much? Well, that, that could be from, from the stuff I've been reading that ADHD is kind of a bucket of different things. And well, they yeah, use that, that one term. And so some people that are thrown into that bucket, that, that's the case with them. Uh, uh, others, they're you know, maybe differentiated in, in what symptoms, so-called, are used to give them that diagnosis. So the, the one thing that came across is like there's the uh, DSM manual that, ident- that lists for psychologists to assess whether a person has qualifies for being ADHD. Do and you they know what to, DSM is? It's the Diagnostical and Statistical Manual Thank you. for such right. and such or whatever, and I don't know which number it's out in now, but... They revise it every now and then. But you have to have, you have to manifest, according to what I was reading, at least for six months continuously. Uh, it has to occur by the age of seven and has to affect negatively, impacting at least two life situations, like in, in the home, in the school, in social settings. So it's it's a pretty rigorous kind of a testing, but some of the criteria that have to show up are pretty vaguely defined, and so it's open to a lot of subjective interpretation. Inattention, impulsivity, and or hyperactivity. Yeah, and then there's also the, some literature is reporting that, well, a lot of the psychiatrists that are given, or psychologists or whoever is doing the diagnosing that gives these diagnoses, they aren't actually using the standards in the manual. They did a study where they sent out... Uh, profiles on cases to these people to return their diagnostic evaluation of the individuals that are supposedly behind this, each of these these cases that were submitted to them and there was an over-diagnosis that that the professionals who were conducting the study compared the descriptions in these cases with against the DSM standards and they didn't meet the criteria yet these the people they were submitted to, the psychologists, they came back and said, yeah, they've got ADHD, even though they didn't meet the standards in the manual. Yeah, so, so there's an overdiagnosis there. Okay. And, and then the, the, another problem with the diagnosis is where a lot of times they rely not on their observations of the child, but on what they're told by the teachers or the parents or whoever. And so in, the, in the case of children from in, in lower social economic status, it's more likely it's been shown that their classroom sizes are going to be larger. There are going to be more kids in there who are suffering from poverty. And so a lot of them are going to be unruly because their parents are too busy, you know, trying to make a living or survive. And yeah. and, and maybe there's some um, convenience factor in there for the teachers and school officials to get kids under control. Yeah, to drug them up to derail to damp down their behavior that's disruptive. And that, that would cause the link between poverty or you know low SES and uh, and the high diagnoses rates. That's one factor that could be yeah. involved. Yeah, there. just yeah. one. Yeah. But I remember, um, and I told you this story uh, I think a week ago, um, when I did a radio show in Alexandria, Louisiana, many years ago, we heard that the local, the teachers in the local elementary schools were walking out 
starting the next day and the schools were asking for volunteers so naturally being the responsible radio talk show host that I was I went down there to be a hero and make a big deal and advertise you know with my radio station badge and everything to help out and when I got there kids had just come in that morning and it, it shocked me that the kids came out of their classrooms I guess after homeroom whatever and lined up at the nurses station all the way down the hallway and each one was being given some kind of medication in a little plastic or paper cup I don't know what it was but I mean there were a lot of kids getting in line to take this medication and I I thought this is weird and you know, we didn't have this when I was a kid mm-hmm. you know of course they didn't have all these drugs when I was a kid either so I don't know you know but you know that I thought that was interesting that uh, you know like you we're saying here, you know, that there may be an overdiagnosis in kids who are poor simply to, as a convenience factor. Yeah, and some of the studies of overdiagnosis were showing that uh, there's like a 30% greater rate of ADHD diagnosed in kids born in August compared to those born in September, which correlates with when the school year starts, so that the ones with the lower rate are like 11 months older than the ones with a higher rate, and so the the critique there is that well these they're just not as neurologically developed and so their behavior is more that of someone who's almost a year younger and so if you're going to use a bell curve of behavior and lop off the lower portion and saying well they're hyperactive so we're going to diagnose them this way then those younger ones would be more likely to fall into that. right yeah there was a doctor that read that in one of the um, articles i read he said the same thing basically that a child who's hyperactive who was also a lot younger than his peers could just be a typical kid for that age. He's just immature. You know? yeah. So, and we don't know, but less of course, mature, yeah. yeah, or less mature. Uh, that good point. Yeah. But um, okay, um, there are some other risk factors. Well, let's get back to first though. They don't know what ADHD really is. They don't. Yeah, we don't know what yeah, causes it. Well, there, yeah, there's what is it, and then when you figure out what it is or well, what causes it, back with what is it, another doctor, Dr. Amen, who has clinics uh, that do brain scans and try to, they, it looks at the activity in various par- portions of the brain, various yeah. regions of the brain, and from looking at those brain scans on thousands, he says about half of the, of the kids that he does brain scans is for ADHD. Right. And he's identified seven distinct categories. He, he, he claims there's seven different conditions that are lumped under this one label. So, and he said that pharmaceuticals that are said to be effective are only effective on, out of, for two out of these seven different categories. Yeah, and so. as long as it's the one that calms the kid down, I guess it's all right, right? Yeah. Or, or, or solves the problem that an adult has a Perhaps I'm just being cynical at that. But uh, anyway, you're listening to Wayne Parker and Lang Baker here on A Pause for Thought. We're discussing attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or possibly attention difference disorder um, among children and primarily children in poorer communities all over the Western world, actually. 343-9927. Call in and share your thoughts and questions. 343-9927. Give us a shout. Okay, Lang, so we don't, we have like a general criteria of behaviors that are often diagnosed as. That are lumped into this bucket. That yeah, they're just lumped ADHD. in it. Oh, it's ADHD, right. But um, we're not really sure what causes these things, but we know that there are some drugs that solve the problems. Or, that, yeah, or, or mask the symptoms, or mask however the symptoms, you want right. right. to well, categorize it. Right, well. Yes. It. Okay. But yes. Okay. He was hyperactive before. Now he's a zombie. You know, he's problem cured. Problem fixed. Yeah. Problem <laughs> fixed. Right. Um, and like one one doctor in one of the uh, articles or studies I read, I just said studies because it sounds better than articles. Uh, she pointed out that we're treating very young kids with these very powerful drugs. And not only do we know what we're treating... We don't know the effect these drugs are going to have long term on these kids or what they're really doing to the kids at the time, I guess. And that just occurred to me. I mean, these are powerful toxins, basically. And what kind of a long term effect will it have on their kidneys, their liver and, and everything else? Not to, not to mention their brains, you know. 
Yeah, I, there's some, no data. Some of what I read said, yeah, that there haven't been studies on on the long term effects on. Well, there hasn't been a long term really of the implementation or the use yeah. of the drugs, has there? Well, I mean, one one fellow, he's a psychiatrist who says he prescribes this a lot and that it has it's effective in eighty percent of the cases, and he's saying that it's been used for this since the 1930s. And that's why he claims it's perfectly safe is because it's been used since the 1930s, basically saying it's like stimulants, amphetamines. I mean, there have been other drugs right. that have been developed more recently that are supposed to uh, impact it in a different way. I saw another psychiatrist giving a lecture talking about the three different categories of medications that are used and how one of them focuses on the limbic system, which affects the emotions, which is really just turning them into a zombie and is not really addressing where the identified brain problems are that have been associated with his behavior, which are more in the temporal lobe, and, and then some of the other more recently developed drugs, uh, not the temporal lobe, prefrontal, uh, and some more recent drugs yeah, I was gonna ask fo- you about fo- that. Fo- focusing more on, on the dopamine receptors, which have been in some studies shown to be associated with these conditions. Uh, the, and, and so these drugs are supposed to be acting on the dopamine receptors or the whole dopamine uh, cycle process in the in the brain, but the, then there's the whole question, well, what does it do to those receptors in other parts of the body, which right. is one of the problems that's come up with some of the other drugs used for other things, you know, where they have side effects that... Yeah, the whole brain, as far as we know, works together in a multitude of ways, most of which we're not aware of. And interacts with the rest of the body as and well. It, and it, right, right. And so if you alter one factor, you don't... You, we have no idea what effect it's going to have on everything else. It could change the the functioning of the brain overall, which can affect other things. Yeah. Or permanently change the brain, like you were saying earlier with neuroplasticity. Um, neuroplasticity was the explanation one doctor gave for being cautious about using these because uh, it's a, un, unlike an antibiotic that's in there to, to kill off an, invas- an invasive bacteria or something. These are there to alter brain function, and when they do, then their brain responds to that. And so under neuroplasticity, uh, the brain itself is changed by these. It's right, just, and that's a natural process that I've actually used in quitting smoking years ago. Is, you know, the, the, if a part of the brain becomes disused, um, its transmitters get snapped up by the other parts of the brain that are more active. And yeah. so that activity is weakened. So if we're talking about... Um, dopamine creation or, or receptors, the brain just won't won't do it on its own anymore. That was her. That was her what theory. She, what right. she was was yeah. asserting as a a reason to be cautious with this. Sure. Well, I, I think we should be cautious with it, no matter what, because like you know, like we were saying here, we don't even know what ADHD is precisely, what causes it, yeah, or what side effects there might be of these drugs that only take care of or suppress some of the symptoms. Yeah, you know, so yeah. um, it just—it really is kind of shocking, and I'm surprised I would say that because we've seen so much else uh, that what is also shocking. But it—it just—it's almost like a conspiracy, you know, like somebody's deliberately trying to push these drugs on uh, a certain market. Well, there there are some reports out there that suggest that may be the case. There's somebody. Uh, I'm, I'm, Put out a book. Uh, I forget his first name. Schwartz. He's a New York Alan, Times. Alan, Alan, Alan yeah. Schwartz, a New York Times reporter who who uh, put out a book on on the overdiagnosis on the overdiagnosis issue. And uh, the title of his book is ADHD Nation: Children, Doctors, Big Pharma in the Making of an American Epidemic. And so he he investigates the links between the pharmaceutical industry and the diagnosis and treatment of ADHD. And uh, this was mentioned in uh, a blog on the Harvard University Health Department portion of that of Harvard's website, the Harvard Health blog. It, just, it was just out a uh, couple couple two three months ago, or no, about a year ago. And uh, it starts off talking about Gretchen Watson, who a clinical psychologist, doing uh, research on the discrepancy or the differences in the rates of diagnosis in different school districts in Virginia. And she came up with this astounding uh, 
result showing drastic differences from one school district to another. Uh, and, and as a result, there was a lot of interest generated in then an anonymous letter claiming she engaged in f- academic fraud, was received by the school where she worked, and so they stopped all that research while they did an investigation. Well, she was exonerated at the end of the investigation, but in the meantime, this had been... Uh, you know, she lost her funding and everything else in the, for the in study. The, in the data yeah. that had been collected in the, the initiation of some response to this, all that... All, that disappeared. Yeah, so, it would have been interesting. Go ahead. So th- th- that's what raised this question. Well, well, who's behind this anonymous letter? And then they start talking about this book. Uh, in, po- in the book, it's pointed out that there's a close linkage between a lot of the researchers and the pharmaceutical industry. And in fact, uh, one, of the, one of the articles I found that was talking about um, the neurological basis for ADHD was conducted by some researchers in Italy uh, and they were when the, one of the some of the were basically it was describing what the the brain the se- parts of the brain that were associated with this and with with this condition but at the beginning of of the abstract of her her report and this is this is uh a report that appeared in it, well, it's available on the National Institutes of Health website. So it's that's I guess because she's a researcher basically, and she's pointing out what the research has shown as to the involvement of different regions of the brain, which is supposed to justify justify using these uh, pharmaceuticals to address it. But at the in the abstract, it says to date, stimulants are the most effective psychopharmacological treatments available. Drug treatment should always be a part of the comprehensive plan. So she's asserting that as an advocate, uh, sounds to me like. And then, then at the end of it, it discloses what her competing interest is. She's an advisory board member for Eli Lilly and Shire and received research grants from Eli Lilly and Shire. And this report uh, by hers that, that she made was uh, in uh, back in 2010, so it was back a few years ago. But more recently in 2004, well, more recently in 2017 and previously in 2004, uh, there were headlines on Reuters where Shire wins the U.S. approval for a long-acting ADHD drug. And in 2004, there's a headline, first non-stimulant ADHD medication available in the United Kingdom, which is a press release from Eli Lilly. So she's receiving, serves an on advisory member and receives research grants from these two drug companies that are developing and promoting the kind of drugs that she's saying should be part of every... Every treatment plan, yeah. yeah. And you and I did a show a long time back on, I don't know if it was about the Food and Drug Administration and the approval, the accelerated approval of drugs, but we found in our you know, readings regarding that show that a large number of the people who serve or advise the Food and Drug Administration are associated with and funded by drug companies. Yeah, yeah. It's a lot like uh, you, could, you could compare it to the uh, research on global warming by the fossil fuel industry and research on tobacco by the tobacco, tobacco industry-funded yes. uh, scientists. So it's not surprising. No, it's not. And um, like we were talking before the show, uh, you know, you look at all the societal problems we have today, all the behavioral problems, and you look back over the last 50 years or so, and there are so many lobbyists, I mean, gun gun violence and, and mass murders and whatnot, and uh, the gun manufacturers, I mean, they're all stockholder owned as far as I know, so they their boards of directors have to give a good dividend to their stockholders, so they need to sell more and different kinds of guns to more people. And that creates a social ill. Smoking, of course, did and is. Uh, and, of course, we're, we're, the opioid crisis is another one that's, you know, it's just like it seems like our whole society is being killed over, you know, in order to save our retirements, you know, because, you know, hey, let's face it, I'm, I'm in, in the stock market through mutual funds, and I want to get good returns, you know. So anyway, you're listening to Wayne Parker and Lang Baker here on A Pause for Thought on Baton Rouge Community Radio, 96.9 FM, here in Baton Rouge. We're talking about attention deficit or attention difference disorder uh, diagnoses, what it is, how it's treated, 
some of the interesting, odd apps, aspects of it. Three four three nine nine two seven. We got about six minutes left. Three four three nine nine two seven. If you'd like to call in and share your comments, Lang, there was one other study I read that looked at other factors besides what else they don't know about what causes ADHD. But they they found that uh, there's a possible link between ADHD and pesticides. A uh, 2010 study in pediatrics found that children with higher urine levels of organophosphate, which is a pesticide used, pesticide used in produce, had higher ADHD rates. And another study in 2010 showed that women with higher urine levels of organophosphate were also uh, more likely to have children with ADHD. Uh, they talk about fetal exposure to alcohol and tobacco is also thought to play a role. And they, they, there are speculations that, you know, women from lower socioeconomic statuses would uh, be more inclined to smoke or consume alcohol during their pregnancy. I don't know if there's any data to support that, but yeah, well, go ahead. Well, uh, that study you were talking about earlier in Britain with the Association of uh, Lower uh, Income Levels yeah. and uh, Incidence of ADHD, some of the... Uh, conclusions from that study were that uh, ADHD was associated with indicators of the social and economic disadvantage, including lone parenthood as opposed to uh, two parents in the home, younger motherhood, income levels, maternal education, housing tenure, tobacco, as you mentioned, and alcohol. And it's interesting that some other studies are looking at the impact these kinds of environmental and life situation factors can have on genes through the epigenetic mechanism. And epigenetic is... Epigenetic is is how the environment impacts turning on and off genes. Okay, so the idea is that we have, we're all born with a whole bunch of genes, many of which don't become active. Well... Um, a lot of genes get turned on and off at various times in our life, and some get turned on or off dependent on what we encounter in the environment, and some of us have different versions, SNPs, uh, which are a particular section of the, dream, of the gene that have different vari- different varieties, and portions of the population have one version and others have a different okay, version. Okay, but the point which, is... Which renders them more susceptible, gives them a higher risk if those SNPs get turned on or if they have those SNPs. So there's been genes that have been associated with a higher risk of ADHD, and then there have been studies now into the epigenetics that turn these genes on or off. And some of those are associated with, or have been shown to affect the dopamine uh, mechanism within the brain, which is what we're talking about, that some of these these uh, psychopharmaceuticals are intended to attack. So there there's a linkage there between the kinds of treatments and the epigenetics and the genes in the brain chemistry that's going on that's been connected to ADHD, but it's like the stimulants are going in after the fact to try to ameliorate in some way what's happening. To suppress the happening, symptom, basically. And which yeah. is basically looking at it at the symptomatic level instead of looking at, well, if these are the lifestyle factors that are turning those genes on in the first place, what we, can we do to uh, alter people's understanding in life, cho- life choices, environmental factors so that the genes don't get turned on in the first place. Yeah, or maybe we could turn them back off again. Um, maybe, I you don't know. If, if the genes were turned on through a traumatic event, we could bring the kid into a room and all of a sudden go, boo, or <laughs> something, you know, <laughs> or whatever, you know, traumatize him somehow, punch him in the head or whatever. <laughs> uh, speaking of which, you know, um, I thought of that as a joke, basically, when we were getting ready for the show, but since all we're doing, basically, is clubbing these kids with these drugs, basically... I mean, why not just club them with a stick? You know, it, it's kind of the same thing. You just, just knock them upside the head or throw these drugs at them that will, you know, just chemically suppress their behavior so they'll shut up and sit down, you know. Um, it, it's kind of... there. There's a certain analogy there to... <laughs> yeah, yeah I'm sure I'm well, exaggerating things. Well, but. I mean, one flew over the cuckoo's nest. They're you know, drugging him up so he doesn't... Misbehave under the standards of behavior under that, the are, standards of behavior, that are imposed right. in, his, yeah. in the environment that he, the institutionalized environment that he's in, which is 
You know, the school's an institution that requires certain behavioral standards be observed, and if they don't observe it, then you diagnose with ADHD, and so 